I could probably do this off the top of my head, but I will read. <laughs> yeah. um, Amanda Harris is a senior research fellow at Sydney Conservatorium of Music um, here at the University of Sydney and director of the Sydney unit of the digital archive Paradisec. Um, if you don't know, it's a fabulous archive of Pacific and regional digital sources and endangered cultures. Amanda is interested in hearing the voices of those often excluded from conventional music histories through collaborative research focused on gender and intercultural musical cultures. The monograph representing Australian Aboriginal music and dance, 1930 to 1970, was published by Bloomsbury Publishing in 2020. And she publishes, publishes in journals across history and music disciplines. Um, and she's also one of the conveners of this symposium. Um, so thanks very much, Amanda. And we look forward to hearing about this work today. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. Um, yeah, acknowledging country is, I think, something that's very um, meaningful in keeping front of mind the Aboriginal country that we're on. And I want to um, acknowledge the Gaddi country that we're on and the elders past and present who continue to care for this country and the songs that continue to be sung and um, are still ringing in my ears um, over the last three days. And, um, and also extend respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and Indigenous people from elsewhere who've been part of this um, terrific few days. I'm feeling so lucky to be in this session in particular, but also in just to be talking with all of you over the last few days. It's just been um, so sparked so many thoughts and so many interesting conversations. And in this presentation, I want to flip the key terms of the symposium's theme, reimagining and programming, to think about how we might reprogram Australian music history imaginaries. And I'm not doing this in an attempt to subvert or undermine the symposium's theme. On the contrary, um, I've been really excited by um, the way we've formulated the theme as our thinking has gone along. And as the program has taken shape in response to the call for papers that we sent out, also really excited by the astonishing creativity and innovation inherent in the range of presentations and performances that we've all been enjoying over the past few days. Indeed, it's the breadth of these conceptions of musical programming that I think encourages me to extend the challenges that this symposium offers to the field of musical performance into another realm, that of how we write our music histories as well as how we perform them. I'd like to invoke Clint Bracknell and Linda Barwick's formulation in their recent article, The Fringe or the Heart of Things, in which they ask, where Indigenous music rightly sits in the tertiary landscape of Australian music institutions situated on Aboriginal land that are nevertheless largely focused on European musical traditions. Showing that Australian tertiary music schools are skewed towards European music, with many offering little or no Indigenous content, with this trend also evident in school music programs, Bracknell and Barwick suggest Uh, considering the perennially endangered status of regional Indigenous musical idiom, idioms and the way they're customarily evoked in attempts to showcase distinctive Australian culture, their exclusion from most music scholarship and curriculum indicates a serious disjuncture between Australia's current cultural aspirations and its practical realities. As Bracknell and Barwick note, our disciplines associations are becoming more and more inclusive. The most recent journal of the International Association for the Study of Popular Music is devoted to popular music decolonisation and Indigenous studies. And the last few recent issues of Musicology Australia also featured a special issue on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander music, alongside terrific articles, many, um, um, many of the ones in that special issue, but also many since authored by um, participants in this conference on everything from early 20th century classical music cultures to Australian bird song, rave music, histories of African American orchestral conductors, and Irish folk music. The National Recording Project for Indigenous Music and Dance in Australia runs an annual conference in parallel with the MSA each year. And the International Council for Traditional Music has strong study groups on Indigenous music and dance and on the music of Oceania. The challenge offered by Bracknell and Barwick's title, The Fringe or the Heart, asks what it means to think about music made, taught and researched on Aboriginal land as a fringe discipline, however, rather than being at the heart of all that we do. 
This brings me to the idea of the imaginary that music history has constructed for itself and that it operates within. To define what I mean by imaginary, I turn now to Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor, who suggests a social imaginary is that common understanding that makes possible common practices and a widely shared sense of legitimacy. Our social imaginary at any given time is complex. It incorporates a sense of the normal expectations we have of each other, the kind of common understandings that enable us to carry out the collective practices that make up our social life. This incorporates some sense of how we all fit together in carrying out the common practice. Such understanding is both factual and normative. That is, we have a sense of how things usually go, but this is also interwoven with an idea of how they ought to go. Of the various theorizations of imaginaries that I might have drawn on in playing with our symposium's terms, Taylor's is useful, not least of all, for the metaphor from performance that he uses to explain the kinds of political and economic social imaginaries his book is focused on. He says, we can think of the social imaginary of a people at a given time as a kind of repertory, including the ensemble of practices they can make sense of, the actors have to know what to do, the ensemble of actors has to agree on what the practices are. From the earliest writing about Australian music history, our music history imaginary has defined the boundaries of our repertory in European terms. Lorna Sterling stated in one of these early histories that Australia's music history may be said to date from the very moment of her colonization and there's a bit more of uh, what she says there for context. This assessment of music in Australia's imagined beginnings echoed over the decades. In performer and music broadcaster James Glennon's 1968 volume, he suggested that it could be said that the story of music in Australia began in 1790 when the HMS Sirius sailed into Port Jackson, Sydney and landed the colony's first piano. The way these boundaries have been set comes to the heart of what we imagine music to be and how we narrate our histories of music. The way we write about history can result in individual parts of the story being told as though they were the story. In 1994, Bruce Johnson provocatively suggested that the conventional reading of Australia's musical history can only be sustained by excluding most of the music that's actually happened in this country. Four years after Lorna Sterling, performer and historian Isabel Moresby repeated the claim about music arriving on the Australian continent with a European piano in her 1948 book, Australia Makes Music. But then she also went on to devote a full chapter of the book to Aboriginal music, suggesting in a forward-looking spirit that songs that will be handed on perhaps for centuries are still being composed by Aborigines. In a preface to Moresby's book, conductor and later director of the New South Wales State Conservatorium, now the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, Bernard Hines welcomed this conceptualisation of music making, suggesting it reflected this stage in our musical development. So I suppose what I'm saying is scholars have tried and continue to try to bring our musical experiences into a single frame, even if the imaginaries about music being embodied by imported pianos rather than say by Aboriginal singers and songlines, have limited how we grapple with music making on what always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I've been thinking a lot about how we might rewrite histories of music in this place by focusing on place, on people and on the policies that have shaped the way we talk about, teach and research music. Um, uh, particularly at particular sites and through particular events. And in the remainder of the presentation, I'll explore a couple of events that I suggest allow us to write reprogrammed stories of musical practice in Australia that make the sounds of place and people resonant. I'll explore two historical musical programs at major events in the 1970s. We could say that this is a key era for Australian music. It has been thought about that way in a lot of musicological work. Um, the two events are the International Expo in Osaka, Japan in 1970, and the Festival of Musical Events programmed to open the Sydney Opera House just down there in 1973. 
I'm interested in these kinds of events for the ways that they define themselves publicly and internationally as representations of Australian culture. Um, and the ways this might sometimes be at odds with how we're accustomed to narrating uh, what's happened in Australian music history. Each event featured new compositions by Australian art music composers, as well as music and dance performed by a new ensemble called the Aboriginal Theatre Foundation. In 1973, this was also complemented by the inclusion of ensembles from wider Oceania as part of a South Pacific festival that was an official part of the Opera House opening programming. Um, and I haven't just cherry picked these events to make a point, or I mean, you can judge, but rather I suggest that they're illustrative of a range of events that structure our shared music history in the nation now known as Australia. And the way the musical events have been profiled in very recent musicology tells us something about the continuities of the music history imaginary that I've been um, laying out uh, in some of these early slides. So to start with the 1970 International Expo in Osaka, Japan. Now, I'm aware this may not be immediately obvious as a key event in music history, but these kinds of international events capture a sort of snapshot of, of musical culture that Australia presents to the wider world. Um, the lineup of performers demonstrates the breadth of this conception of representative Australian music, with popular folk entertainer Rolf Harris as master of ceremonies, the concert programs featured jazz and pop performers Judy Stone and Don Burroughs and the newly formed Aboriginal Theatre Foundation. And then in the modernist architecture of its exhibition hall, a musical installation by art music composer George Dreyfus played on a loop, accompanying displays of Australian technological feats and Aboriginal bark paintings that demonstrated Australia's unique visual art contribution to the world's culture. In other concert programs at the event, the Australian Youth Orchestra performed a newly commissioned work, Music for Japan, by art music composer Peter Skolfop. Um, and the rest of the program that the orchestra played uh, included works by Percy Granger and Europe, by European composers Britton, Dvorak, Berlioz, Brahms, Janefelt, Boccherini and Vaughan Williams. Much of the scholarship on uh, Australia's self-representation at the Expo has focused on the architecture of the physical structures. Um, the actual pavilion hall is the top left, from your view, um, of, of the slide there. Um, and objects in the hall, um, the inside of the hall is shown on the bottom left. You can see some of the bark paintings there. Um, as well as on film made of the event, and that, that still comes from one of those films. So there's, there's a lot of writing on this kind of visual aspects of this. There's more limited um, discussion in the musicological record, but there is an article by Joel Crotty in um, 2015 in Musicology Australia, in which um, he explores the significance of the new work, Music for Japan, commissioned from Skullfall for the event. Crotty's analysis is a nuanced assessment of the place of this work in representations of Australia. He writes about Skolfop's turn towards Asian music in rejection of a European aesthetic and the less than smooth reception of those ideas among Japanese and German composers alike. And he also discusses Skolfop's later edition of a didgeridoo part to the work, suggesting it was indicative of, quote, the composer's self-generated need to market himself as an overt transmitter of Australianness. Crotty also mentions Don Burroughs' contribution to the jazz components of the soundtrack in the exhibition hall and discusses the art music composers who are featured in other um, exhibition halls, particularly the Russian and German exhibitions at the Expo. But no mention is made in Crotty's account of the performances of the ensemble that formed the Aboriginal Theatre Foundation and the music they performed, nor, by the way, of Rolf Harris's folk music or Judy Stone's pop singing. Um, that the photo at the bottom right there, by the way, is the performance arena in Osaka. This is the ensemble that performed uh, at that event on that main concert stage, the same one that the um, Australian Youth Orchestra performed on. And uh, the Aboriginal Theatre Foundation's ensemble was comprised of all of the performers named there and pictured on the screen, some of whom in 1970 already enjoyed international reputations as expert musicians. Perhaps the most famous among these performers is, uh, was David Gulpalil, who recently passed, 
um, who became later became very famous as an actor and uh, also for his dancing and the terrific film he made a few years before he passed away. Um, but also Jolly Liwonga and David Blanazi, um, David Blanazi's grandson Shannon Lee was on the stage here yesterday playing uh, Arawir Didgeridoo. Blanazi had in 1970 already established a performance relationship with Rolf Harris. That's the two of them pictured in London the year before. Um, though this wasn't the reason the group was included in the expo. Um, but this, this wasn't a scratch ensemble thrown together for the expo, rather they were a landmark group that by 1970 were already almost a decade in the making, um, not to mention the thousands of years of musical and dance practices that the group uh, brought together. The group rewrote the rules for public performance modes and continued long practices of trade of songs across regions of Australia. The Aboriginal Theatre Foundation were instrumental to a shift towards performance of Aboriginal songs and accompanying dances onto a national and international stage, freed from the government imposed restrictions of the assimilation era. The organisation was led initially by non-Indigenous and Aboriginal collaborators, and by 1975 it had become a fully Aboriginal-led arts organisation that we might see as the precursor to arts organisations of the present day, um, ones like Bangara Dance Theatre and even the Naraboria First Nations Composer Initiatives. Now, these are very different types of ensembles, but are similarly driven by an Indigenous-led agenda to create space for public performance of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural practices. Several of the 1970 performers would also be involved in premieres of new art music work. So David Gulplil and Dick Bundalil performed in Margaret Sutherland's opera, The Young Kabali in 1972 in Adelaide and Melbourne and others performed in James Pembethy's opera Dalgary for the opening of the Sydney Opera House, which I'll come to in a moment. Uh, Joel Crotty's article about this event approaches music history in exactly the way I'm thinking about it, um, looking at, a, at an event and seeking to understand its significance in our cultural history, placing music in the context of discussions about visual art, architecture, national representations of culture, and performing ensembles shaping our performance futures. And yet Aboriginal music and dance performed at this event remains outside of this frame, though non-Indigenous composer Skullthorpe's later incorporation of a didgeridoo into his piece sits within the frame of what um, that article discusses. Let's turn now to the opening of the Sydney Opera House in 1973. At the opening concert attended by Queen Elizabeth II, the Sydney Symphony Orchestra featured a new orchestral work commissioned by APRA and the ABC and entitled Jubigali. You might um, recall the word Jubigali from the first day of our conference. It's the original name of the point that's now known as Benelong Point that Sydney Opera House sits on um, and is the site where the song that Jacinta and Sien sang was documented as women came ashore in Nui's a bit like that one. Um, so John Anthill was the composer of this work that was commissioned by APRA and ABC and he named that work Jubigali. Um, John Anthill had of course um, composed numerous so-called Aboriginal ballets in the years leading up to that. The Sydney Symphony Orchestra's program was completed with a rendition of Beethoven's Symphony No. 9 with the full forces of Sydney Philharmonia choirs rendering the final movements Order und die Freude. Musicologists examining the works performed for the opening of the Sydney Opera House have focused on the ways, the ways that Australian composers sought to shape works that spoke to the national character and distinctiveness of place, just as Antil's orchestral work, work used the Aboriginal name for the site, Jubigali. Two examples of this recent musicological work emphasise the importance of the first stagings of Australian opera at the Sydney Opera House musicological interventions that, that are important, not least of all, because the opera is actually included in the official opening, uh, the festival fortnight of the official opening, where Prokofiev's War and Peace, Wagner's Tannhäuser and Mozart's M Magic Flute. So musicologists are very actively profiling the Australian operas that were included, uh, that were performed in the earliest days of the Opera House. Anne Boyd's 2011 chapter focuses on Peter Sculthorpe's opera, Rites of Passage, commissioned for the Sydney o Opera House opening, but not ready in time. And so it was eventually performed in 1974. 
Boyd points out that it was the first appearance of Arundel language on Sydney Opera House stages, suggesting that it paved the way for the use of the same language found 30 years later in Gordon Williams and Andrew Schultz's Journey to Horseshoe Bend. In 2018 and 2020, David Simons wrote about the performance of James Pemberthy's Dalgary in 1973 at the Sydney Opera House, and he mentions that there were a group of Aboriginal dancers from Northwest Australia featured in part of the opera. David Simons is the author of multiple books about Australian art music composers, and in particular, what, about what he calls the Jindy Warabak composers, composers whose work drew extensively on words from Aboriginal languages, stories, and sometimes song melodies, or evocation of didgeridoo drones. The Aboriginal Theatre Foundation, again, provided the dancers for the featured opera that Simons writes about, but that wasn't their only role. The ensemble was featured as part of the opening festival itself, whereas actually the operas by Larry Sitsky and James Pemberthy were performed by student ensembles, some, some from the CON and also from UNSW, as test productions on the stages months before uh, the official opening. And Skullthorpe's, as I said, wasn't actually performed until the year after. The Aboriginal Theatre Foundation, on the other hand, were part of the Festival of the South Pacific uh, which featured on the Sydney Opera House Concert Hall stage. Um, you probably can't read that, but that's the program of all the um, main stage acts that uh, performed during the opening festival. During the festival fortnight and two days after the royal concerts that the Queen attended featuring orchestral music by Beethoven, Wagner and uh, John Antill um, and opera, so, yeah, an opera by Prokofiev. That, that was opera, yeah, anyway, opera by Wagner as well. Just some arias were excerpted at different points as well. Um, though in the musicological record, the involvement of these Aboriginal dancers is sort of written in a single sentence as a side note to a bigger story of pioneering Australian opera on the stages of the Sydney Opera House. The ensemble who provided the dancers deserves more than a side note in our music history. By 1973, the Aboriginal Theatre Foundation was proactively proposing Aboriginal involvement in major festivals across the country and was also engaged in the kind of intra-community engagement that we talked about yesterday in the presentation with Maung musicians from Warawi on Goulburn Island, whose, whose families were involved in many of these performances that I'm talking about and who still perform publicly in that way. Um, here too is a powerful, if extremely grainy, especially up there, image of some other performers who were in the larger festival of the South Pacific. Um, these were from uh, performers from Papua New Guinea who were also members of the PNG Defence Force. And we might think it would be sensible to exclude performers from PNG on the steps of the Sydney Opera House from our Australian music history imaginary, but it might do to remind ourselves that Papua New Guinea was still an Australian territory in 1973. And Michael Samari attended the opening meeting with Queen Elizabeth at the Sydney Opera House just two years before he would become Prime Minister of the newly independent nation of Papua New Guinea. So under the Australian nation's own terms, this too could be thought about as Australian music history. Um, I've attempted to um, use these two events to think through what historical milestones we emphasise in our accounts of Australian music history and how these draw the boundaries of our musical imaginaries. And so I return to Charles Taylor's social imaginary. And at the end of his book, Taylor suggests that the utility of understanding and defining our social imaginaries is that it allows us to become conscious of our local particularities. With the realize, he says, with the realization that differences matter comes the humbling insight that there's a lot we don't understand, that we lack even the adequate language to describe these differences. Negatively, it's very important to set about provincializing Europe in Depeche Chakrabarti's pithy phrase. To my mind, nowhere is it more urgent to provincialize U European music than on Aboriginal land. And I wonder if provincializing music that takes a European art music form might be one way we could expand the shape of our Australian music history imaginary. And by provincialising, I mean not erasing, not sort of ignoring or um, you know, expunging from the record, but rather imagining uh, these musical practices as just one local particularity in a larger picture of Australian musical stories 
rather than being the main story that we tell about our history. I've aimed to use two historical events that celebrate place and Australian musical cultures to think about how the shape of our music histories might be expanded. This could enable us to better situate music in broader histories of musical encounters in the Australian nation's oceanic location and also in its colonial history. So as well as approaching music history along established disciplinary lines, for example, focusing on opera perform to open the opera house, we might also reprogram our imaginary to view the broader event and to listen to the historical resonances of place that might be revealed as a result. Thanks. Thanks so much, Amanda. It's wonderful, a wonderful flipping of the themes. <laughs> and um, I love the idea of thinking of that, you know, taking that provincializing Europe idea and applying it to the way we think about music histories and music today. Thank you so much. I think we have some questions already. <laughs> Hang on just one sec. Um, and we, yeah, at home too, please ask questions. Um, thanks so much, Amanda. That was a, a great talk. And uh, I'm really captivated by the final piece around provincializing Europe and um, um, or provincializing England. And I'm wondering, um, you know, what might be the stakes of that for the way that we think through cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism as a theoretical framework? Um, can we leverage cosmopolitanism in a different way once we provincialize Europe? Yeah, thanks, Chris, for that question. I mean, um, I, I was really thinking about cosmopolitanism a lot in formulating this at one point, um, because that I suppose the idea I was trying to get at is how do we step back far enough to see all of the different. Um, let me put it another way: how do we how do we look at our history and see? the ways we're interconnected and the networks and connections we're forming with each other, much in the way we've been doing over these past few days, instead of, um, instead of what I see as being very keen to define um, the ways in which we're separated, the sort of disciplinary lines along which we can understand the world. And so for a while I was thinking about cosmopolitanism as a framework for understanding that because of the way that it allows us to take in all different kinds of cultural influences. But I think it's also so bound up, depending on where you're coming from, it's such a loaded idea that means something in Europe and means something very different to people living in diaspora, for example, than it might mean to people in other places. So I ended up sort of setting that to one side, that idea of cosmopolitanism. But I think your question is exactly what I'm trying to think about is, you know, how can we actually, you know, um, I don't know, step away from there being sort of a dominant narrative and then efforts to insert other narratives and sort of take a bigger, a bigger view of these networks of interconnection and encounter and um, the ways in which we're all actually relating to each other and learning from one another at a time. So I think that example, you know, I maybe go on about this a, a bit, but, you know, the sort of the, the extent to which we talk about um, you know, just in that one example of the piece music for Japan that didgeridoo was later inserted in that. The extent to which we talk about um, an Indigenous instrument being used in an art music um, composition and yet don't talk about the actual didgeridoo players who were there on that same stage playing their own musical traditions. That's, yeah, that's what I, I, I'm trying to get it away. We could do that. We could talk about both those things not just one and forget about the other one. Yeah. I'm not sure that answers your question, but thanks. We have some more questions here. Yes, we do. Miff. Yeah. Thinking about music history and the um, performance traditions of First Nations people here in, in this country, there's so much that we don't know. And I don't just mean non-Indigenous people like myself. Um, 
drawing on my own experience of working on the classical and performed traditions of First Nations people in inland Australia, from Broome to Bull Kenya, um, there is so much that people themselves have not been able to access. Um, and I'm aware of just how much there has been recorded that people don't know about, we don't, you know, most, and it's so urgent and it's so late and I feel like we're missing, it will, we're missing this opportunity. Um, uh, I'll try and bring this back to the, to the topic. I think there's a lot of groundwork we need to do to be able to seriously engage, uh, do justice to the musical programming that you and I think everyone here wants to see. And I, I just want to have that. Um, it, it's, it's a big job and there's not many people and it's a lot of disciplines from you know, linguists to anthropologists to music researchers that are helping you know, in this endeavour, whether it's repatriating things or reconnecting people. Um, I, I know you know all this, but I'm just putting this out there for everyone. There's such important work to do this to enable exactly what you know, this fantastic imaging, imagining, I think it was, <laughs> that you're um, talking about. So I just, I, I guess I'm sort of saying uh, just how important that work is to, to do this for, you know, many First Nations people. Yeah, and, and in a way, I, I suppose I'm throwing all these sort of provocations out there, but I'm also really conscious that, you know, that the, of the importance of that very specialised and detailed and deep work that requires deep knowledge of a topic rather than trying to, I mean, what I'm talking about now is sort of how can we, we have, you know, all of the the toys in the one bucket, but actually that sort of need for very um, specified knowledge about distinct musical traditions, I, I really see the importance of that and the great value of that. And I suppose I hope that if we can, you know, this the terms I'm playing with right now of expanding the idea of our imaginary, that that actually makes more space for that, because if we can see that as as a really important part of our music history instead of this thing over there that, that oh we should talk about that too but this is but the central story is something else then i hope that that enables that deep dive into you know and and the deep dive into the things that are currently the dominant story as well but yeah but without that knowledge of being able to articulate those genres, those clans, all those things, it's very hard to say something meaningful. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's true. It's also not as well documented. I mean, I just know from my own, the amount of digging I have to do just to find the most basic records of something that I've seen a, a, a reference to having happened when other parts of that same event are meticulously documented in paper files in an archive is you know so it's really recuperative a lot of that work is sort of always trying to be able to tell that story in a way that you know gives it proper attention so i also you know i you know i'm sort of also trying to acknowledge the importance of work other you know some of the scholars i've mentioned are doing you know they're obviously making important interventions as well and maybe haven't had access exactly as you say to the knowledge of you know what music david blanazi was playing on the other hand his his recorded albums were literally released publicly by the Aboriginal Arts Agency, you know, in those in that exact period I'm talking about in 1972. And he was touring, he was playing on TV in Rolf Harris. So we sort of, I feel like we have these blind spots, you know, actually, it's not that the information isn't out there. So we choose to tell some stories and not others. And yeah. Um, I'm sure there's many other questions bubbling away in people's minds. I certainly have more, but we're also a bit over time, so I think at this point we might have more questions over a cup of tea. Um, but please join me in thanking Amanda and all the presenters actually for a really great session. Thank you. Thank you.